Bibles, 1 Corinthians 12. We're in a series called The God I Never Knew, talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, can I just ask you, are you enjoying the series? I think it's fantastic. Um, we've been answering some questions about the Holy Spirit, and last week was, is he Pentecostal? And I enjoyed that message, sharing that with you. This week, I like the title too. This week, I've entitled the message, is he charismatic? <clears throat> So what, what I'm trying to do in this series is take away the miscommunication about the Holy Spirit. Another way to say it is fear. I mean, a lot of people are actually afraid of the Holy Spirit, and that's horrible. So 1 Corinthians 12, look at verse 1. It says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, Here's the reason I wanted to talk about this verse just for a moment. Uh, a lot of believers are ignorant about the Holy Spirit. Now, he didn't say stupid. doesn't mean stupid. It just means that you haven't been taught. If you're ignorant about a subject, you just have not been taught about that subject, or you've been taught misinformation. He says spiritual gifts. This word spiritual is the Greek word pneumatikos. Pneumatikos means empowered by breath or wind. Look at the first part of it, pneumatic. You've probably sometime heard about a pneumatic drill or something. It means it's powered by air. Okay, now concerning spiritual gifts. Let me say it another way. Now concerning gifts that are empowered by the breath of God. Okay, we'll say it one more time because it's got to really catch you. You got to catch this. Now concerning gifts that you can only move in if you allow the Holy Spirit to breathe in you. That's what he's saying. Those are spiritual gifts. The words now concerning, just to give you a little, again, a little Bible lesson here. Uh, they're, in the, uh, for, they're in 1 Corinthians six times. The reason they're there is because Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian church before 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is actually the second letter that he wrote. Uh, I don't know, we don't know what happened in the first letter. I personally think that the Lord said to him, uh, that's not getting in the Bible, oh, buddy. Uh, you're going to you're gonna have to get better if you want it to get in the Bible. So, so he writes a letter, and then they wrote one back. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says in the epistle, earlier letter that I wrote you, and in chapter 7, it says, in the, now concerning the letter you wrote me. And this is all in 1 Corinthians, all right? So when it says now concerning, he's answering the question that they had. Did y'all follow all that? I know this is in the Bible college class, but I just want to give you a little background here. So now concerning spiritual gifts, and uh, I don't want you to be ignorant. Okay, I want to say the same thing to you. I don't want you to be um, uneducated about spiritual gifts. I can't do it all in one message. You need to know that. Uh, so we have other classes. You need to take classes. You need to learn. You need to study. But many, many people have no clue how many gifts there are or how they work. And I'll just tell you, I put the gifts into four categories of gifts, okay? There are the motivational gifts, and those are in Romans 12. You, you, you have one of those, they motivate you. There are the uh, manifestational gifts, which we're gonna talk about today, they're in 1 Corinthians 12. There are the ministry gifts, they're in 1 Corinthians 14. And there are the ministerial gifts in Ephesians 4. They're, those are not gifts of the Holy Spirit, they're gifts of Jesus, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Again, I don't have time to go into all that. But we're going to talk about the manifestational gifts of the Holy Spirit today, charisma of the Lord, all right? So 1 Corinthians 12, look at verse 7. There are nine manifestational gifts of the Holy Spirit. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Just, just a question. I've asked you this before, but it's really important. Are you an each? Yes, you are. So you, these are for you. All nine of these are for you. It is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom, this is one of the gifts, through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the impart, imp, uh, pardon me, to another, discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each, one more time, are you in each? Yes. Okay, to each one individually as He wills. Now, let me explain something about this. Uh, you don't have one of these gifts. Don't go around telling people, I have the word of knowledge, 
or I have the word of wisdom. You don't have any of them. The Holy Spirit has all of them. And he distributes to each one for the profit of all. You can, you can minister in the gift of a word of knowledge at any time that the Holy Spirit allows you to do that. So any person, so I've heard people say, well, I have this. No, you don't. The Holy Spirit does. He has all nine of these and he manifests, the word manifest means to make known. He makes him, them known through each one, everyone, as he wills for the profit of all, all right? So I, what I did was there are nine gifts. Uh, many theologians do this. Uh, we divide them into three categories. That works out well for me because a good sermon always has three points. So it's gonna work out great, all right? So here's the first category and the first three gifts. The discerning gifts. I'm gonna go through three gifts that are what we call the discerning gifts. And I'll, I'll go through each of them, but they're just so you know, the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and discerning of spirits. These are discerning gifts. So let me give you the word of knowledge first. Here's what a word of knowledge is. A word of knowledge is to know something specific without having learned it by natural means. To know something specific without having learned it by natural means. Now, because I'm going through nine, I can't, I can't uh, do like I would normally do. I could spend a class on each of these. But Jesus moved in these gifts because he moved with the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, when he was talking to the woman at the well, he said, go call your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. He said, well, you, you said that right because you've had five and the one you're with is not your husband. Okay, that's a word of knowledge. Now, what many people would say is, well, he was Jesus and Jesus knows everything. You have to remember though, he laid down his divinity and he picked up his humanity. When Jesus was on this earth, he ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. He came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. When he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him. Uh, he said, I cast demons out by the Spirit of God. So he moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the second one, a word of wisdom. This is a divine answer or solution for a particular event. A divine answer or solution for a particular event. In, in John chapter nine, this man gets healed. And they said, we don't even know where this guy's from. And he said, well, this is a marvelous thing. You don't know where he's from, yet he opened my eyes. He said, since the beginning of time, no one has opened the eyes of someone born blind. And then he says this, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And you know what happened? They couldn't answer him. That's a word of wisdom. I mean, God gave him a wise answer. You, you need to go to start going to prayer and let the Holy Spirit speak to you about it. Would that be okay? Because he knows a lot more about your business than you do, by the way, okay? So, and the, here's the third uh, discerning gift, and it's discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits means to be made aware of the presence of a demonic spirit. To be made aware of the presence of a demonic spirit. This happened when there was a girl following Paul uh, around and saying, these men are servants of the Most High, but she was uh, a fortune teller. And you say, well, she's saying the right thing. Yes, but he didn't want a witch confirming their ministry. So he knew it was a demon. He turned around and cast the demon out of her. And just like that, because he was aware, he became aware. Now, I want you to look at this for a moment. Discerning of spirits. That's this, this gift is called discerning of spirits. Now listen to me carefully. It is not called discernment. It's called discerning of spirits. Now listen, there is no gift of discernment in the Bible. Look and see. We're supposed to be discerning. We're supposed to have our senses trained so we can discern good and evil. We're supposed to discern, not saying that's wrong. I'm, just, I'm gonna make a statement and it's gonna get some of you. So just laugh about it with the rest of us, okay? <laughs> but most people that I've met, most, not all, but most that I've met that say, I have the gift of discernment, actually have the gift of criticism. <laughs> Boy, I saw some nudges, wasn't that? <laughs> Praise the Lord, I started some fights, so all right. <laughs> now listen, you may, you may be a discerning person, but you don't have the gift of discernment. There's not a gift of discernment. The reason I say criticism is because people seem to say, well, I have the gift of discernment, and they're actually very critical and very judgmental of other people, and they think that their opinion is God's opinion. And they blame it or validate it on, well, I have this gift from the Bible. Well, I'm just letting you know that gift's not in the Bible. But there is a gift of discerning of spirits, and I just discern that some of you have a critical spirit. So, okay. 
But let me ask you this, would it be all right with you if the Holy Spirit showed you a demonic or evil spirit that was coming against your marriage and you prayed against that? Or coming against one of your children? Or coming against your business? I'm telling you, I'm talking to some business folks. All right, let's keep going. Here's number two, the second category, the declarative gifts. The declarative gifts. Under here would be prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. And I'll, again, I'll, we'll go over each one of them. Prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. In other words, all three use the tongue to declare, all right? First of all, prophecy is a message of encouragement from God through a person. A message of encouragement from God through a person. Now, please hear me. One who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort. It never says correction. The spiritual New Testament gift of prophecy is encouragement. You will see many, many times the word encouragement or encourage used with this. Here's why I say this. It's because, again, many people say, well, I have the gift of prophecy. And they think that they can correct other people and tag, thus says, thus says the Lord on the end of it. And I'd like to warn you about saying, thus says the Lord, when the Lord didn't say. Uh, scripture is um, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 31. Notice this. For you can all prophesy. I don't, I know I don't ask you to do this a lot, but I just wanted to today. Uh, could you repeat the word all? Because this is the Bible. You can all prophesy. You can all prophesy one by one that all may learn, I want you to notice the word learned, and that all may be encouraged. It doesn't say corrected. It says that all may be encouraged. It also says all may learn. Prophecy is a learning. We, we learn. We learn to hear God's voice and we learn to speak it in an encouraging way. Uh, and there, I know that you probably heard some prophecies that uh, they just weren't God. You know, I understand that. People are learning. Uh, I heard about a fellow in Alabama, and uh, he prophesied one. He said, he said, thus says the Lord, I know you're scared. Sometimes I get scared myself. Okay, well, that's not God. I know this is not good grammar, but God don't get scared, okay? But he was learning. He's trying to say, God was saying, hey, I know how you feel, but he don't get scared, all right? So, so we're learning. So I'll say more about prophecy in a moment because I'm going to link tongues and interpretation of tongues to prophecy, and you'll see why in Scripture in a moment. The next is tongues. Tongues is a message from God in a language unknown to the person through whom the message comes. Tongues is a message from God unknown to the person through whom the message comes. Now, well, I'm going to spend a whole message on tongues in two weeks. The next two messages will be the last two of this series. You don't want to miss the next two weeks, all right? Um, but in, I'm going to talk, we're going to talk about it. This is talking about the manifestation of tongues, not a prayer language. So we're going to talk about a prayer language. So the next one is interpretation of tongues. This is understanding and expressing the thought or the intent of the message in tongues. Understanding and expressing the thought or the intent of the message in tongues. Now, um, I have a scripture, but I'm trying to give you all time to, to write down um, the, um, you know, write the definition down. I know some people want to. So let me, let me say something. Um, it's the interpretation of tongues, not the translation. It's the interpretation, not translation. You say, what's the difference? Oh, it's, it's a very big difference. Interpretation is expressing the thought or the intent of what the person just said. Translation is word for word. The UN doesn't have interpreters. They have translators. That's because if somebody says something about a bomb, they will know exactly what he said about a bomb. Not what you think his intent was, but what his intent actually is. You understand what I'm saying? Like when I travel overseas, I, I don't have translators. I have interrupters, pardon me, uh, interpreters. <laughs> I was in Poland preaching one time, and uh, this, uh, my, the interpreter didn't show up. And this guy said to me, I am, I am learning English. I will interpret for you tonight. Well, I didn't have another choice. So I was speaking, I'd say a phrase, he'd say a phrase. I'd say a phrase, he'd say a phrase. And then about every five minutes, he would say, wait a minute. No, no, he would do like this. I remember he would go, 
oh. And then he'd say, just a moment. And then he would talk for like three or four minutes and then the whole church would go, oh. So, so I got to wondering, what was he actually saying? You know, like I would say, you know, Jesus' blood is the propitiation of our sins. And he might have said, I don't know what he just said. Okay, so let me show you a verse here about prophecy and the interpretation of tongues, all right? 1 Corinthians 14, it's probably just one page over if you wanna look at it, verse five, says, I wish you all spoke with tongues. Now, I just wanna stop just for a moment. That's in your Bible. And you say, yes, but Paul wrote that. Paul wrote it, but he didn't author it. The Holy Spirit authored it. This book was God breathed. God breathed the phrase, I wish all of you spoke in tongues. Now that's pretty strong. I'd just like to say, no matter what your religious background is, you're gonna to have to come to grips with that scripture at some point. I wish all of you did. Then I wanna show you the rest of it because again, we have so demeaned this gift of tongues and interpretation. Look, watch this. He says, I wish all of you spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues. I've had a lot of people quote that to me, but watch the very next word. Unless, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification or strengthening, building up. Okay, do you understand what that said? He said the one who prophesies is greater unless it's interpreted. If it's interpreted, then it's the same. That's what he's saying. See, you don't have to know theology to understand this verse, but you do need to know grammar. <laughs> so don't tell me the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless it is interpreted. And here's what he's saying, I wish you all, I wish you all spoke with tongues and I wish all of you prophesied. Why? Because it is encouragement. Here's what he's saying, I wish all of you would encourage each other. Well, that was better than you thought. Let me just say it again. <laughs> I wish all of you would encourage one another. All right, so, so interpretation, not translation, not word for word. Okay, so someone might give a short message in tongues and someone might give a long interpretation or the other way around. There might be a long tongue and then a short interpretation. And people have used that to try and invalidate and say, well, see, it's not true because that was a short message and this was a long one. No, again, it's not word for word. It's interpretation. It's trying to express the thought or the intent of what, was, what the person understood by the Holy Spirit. All right, let me give you an illustration. If you ask my son, how was your day? And I'm talking about James now. If you ask James, my son, how was your day? His interpretation of his day was fine. That is all you will get. If you ask my daughter, how was your day? She'll say, well, I woke up about six. I had a little bit of a sinus headache. I think it's because there's something in the air, but I had great pancakes this morning, really good pancakes. Both the girls slept well. Of course, Kate got up twice and Addie got up one time, but they are sleeping through the night now. I would say that work uh, late while I was working on a new message. Have I told you about the new message, Dad? Okay, <clears throat> you better have some time. <laughs> because her interpretation, are you following me? Of her day, is going to be long. My son's interpretation of his day is going to be short. So you can have a long interpretation. By the way, I said, you know, my son says fine. Sometimes he doesn't even use words. <laughs> we were at the table one night, had all the family over, and we were going around talking, and then I said, hey, James, uh, how, how was your day? This is the way he did. He went, And then I said to him, hey, did you have that meeting you were supposed to have today? He said, I can't remember that. So I said, how was the meeting? And, and you know, God marries us to the perfect woman. His wife, Bridget, said, use your words, honey. Okay, these are the declarative gifts. Here's the last category, the dynamic gifts the dynamic gifts. 
A dynamic comes, and this will be faith, healings, and miracles, okay? Dynamic comes from the Greek word from Acts 1-8. It's in other places too, but that's the one that we're familiar with. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power is the Greek word dunamis. We say dunamis is the way we would say it, but dunamis is the way it would be pronounced. Um, and it means power, uh, but it means explosive power. For instance, there's another word we get from this, and that is dynamite. That's what it means. You shall receive dynamite when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power. So that when you're witnessing, this power just explodes out of you. That's what he's saying. So here are these, these three. Here's the first one, faith. Faith is a supernatural impartation of belief and confidence for a specific situation. Now, the, I'm talking about, not, not talking about faith in general. I'm talking about this, this manifestational gift of the Holy Spirit is a supernatural impartation of belief and confidence for a specific situation. Let me say it this way. Would it be all right with you if you were going through a difficult time and the Holy Spirit just gave you faith that you're going to get through it? See, what I'm trying to tell you is the Holy Spirit's good and his gifts are good. Don't be afraid of him and don't be afraid of any of his gifts. Here's the second under the dynamic gifts, gifts of healings. Gifts, plural, of healings, plural. Gifts of healings are supernatural endowments of divine health. Supernatural endowments of divine health. Um, I read this summer the, um, a biography of Oral Roberts. And I know people have good and bad, and I understand that. And so just for a moment, let's forget whatever you've heard or whatever you feel personally. But one of the reasons that he preached healing is because he was healed. When he was 17 years old, he had tuberculosis. And at that time, there, they did not know of any person that had been healed from tuberculosis. It was a death sentence. There was no vaccination. And uh, he was going to die. And his uncle or his brother, I've read two different accounts, but took him to a meeting to be prayed for. And he was lying in the back seat. He was, he was we from weeks within dying. And the Lord said to him, I'm going to heal you tonight, but I want you to take my message of healing to the world and I want you to build a university where young people can be trained in a Christian atmosphere. And he built, of course, Oral Roberts University, ORU. So, um, but that's why he preached healing. So whether you like him or not, the reason he preached healing is because he got healed. And let me just say this. I know many people have this a negative connotation. Well, you know, we shouldn't talk too much about healing. Okay, people have that connotation until you, they get sick. or someone in their family gets sick. And it's not a bad thing if God heals you. That is not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And this is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And again, this doesn't mean that you have a gift that you go around and everyone you pray for gets healed. This means that you get healed. This, this is a gift of healings, plural. It means every one of them is important to God. And here's the last one, uh, working of miracles working of miracles, divine intervention that alters our natural circumstances. Divine intervention that alters our natural circumstances. How many of you at some time in your life have experienced a miracle? Would you put your hand up? I keep them up for a moment, look around. Isn't that amazing? Okay, you can put your hands down. How in the world would we ever believe that God quit doing miracles? Let me just say something. There's no way he can stop doing miracles because he can't stop being God. And God is a miraculous God. When he gets up in the morning, he does a miracle. When he, if he wants coffee, he says, let there be coffee. That, that's the way he gets his coffee. <laughs> he is a miraculous God. He did miracles all through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament. Why would he have ever stopped? And let me just say something. If you've been saved, you've had a miracle. You've had a supernatural intervention in your life that altered your circumstances. So I want us to not be afraid of these. Any believer can move in any of these anytime when the Holy Spirit empowers us, all right? All right, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. We're in a series called The God I Never Knew, talking about the Holy Spirit, because when I grew up, I didn't hear much about the Holy Spirit, 
And what I did hear about the Holy Spirit was bad. And so I was a little bit afraid of him. And so we've been answering questions every week. This is the third week of the series. The first week was, who is he? Who, who is this guy? Second week, last week was, is he a person? Because some people don't believe he's a person. Is he a person? This week, I, I think I got a great title for you. Here's the title this week, Is He Pentecostal? <laughs> Not a good title. I mean, because, you know, I've heard some things about him. And uh, so, Pastor, you're trying to tell us about this guy. So, I, I just, just, just lay it on the line, is he Pentecostal? Because we know that John was a Baptist, you know. <laughs> well, this is the Bible says, straight out, John the Baptist, you know. So, okay, so is he, and, and then I, we get asked this all the time too, you know, are we Pentecostal? Are we, you know, well, um, just to let you know, we're, we're kind of, um, we're, we're kind of Bapticostal, <laughs> that's all right. All right, I went to a Baptist school, East Texas Baptist University, Crystal Bible College, and thankful for my foundation, uh, but we believe fully in the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, as do many Baptist churches, uh, but we're not a part of the Baptist denomination, we're not a part of the Pentecostal denomination, we're a non-denominational church, and that doesn't make us special. There are a lot of denominational churches that are great churches too, so we're, we're not uh, unique in, in that sense of being special or better than at all. I don't want you to ever think that. But let me, let me put it this way. We, um, we believe in water baptism, but we're not part of the Baptist denomination. We also believe in spirit baptism, but we're not part of the Pentecostal denomination. You, you understand what I'm saying? So when we say, is the Holy Spirit Pentecostal? Well, if by Pentecostal you mean that um, ladies can't wear pants and they can't wear makeup. Uh, and by the way, I love makeup uh, for, for ladies, for ladies. I mean, <laughs> let me cl clarify that. <laughs> There's nothing going on around the house that you don't know about. All right. Okay. So, okay. So for ladies. Okay. All right. So, um, but that's not what I'm talking about. And I'm not putting down people who have that belief. Please don't ever put down someone who's sincere in his or her belief. All right, don't do that. But if by Pentecostal, we mean the biblical definition of the word Pentecost, and that we believe fully in the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, and we believe that Pentecost is the fulfillment uh, of the feast of Pentecost, and we believe that every believer needs a vital relationship with the Holy Spirit, then yes then yes, the Holy Spirit is Pentecostal, but not according to some historical or cultural or, or maybe even denominational definitions. So, to answer this question, we need to answer some other questions, all right? So here's the first one. What, what is Pentecost? See, a lot of people don't even know what Pentecost is. So Acts chapter two, look at verse one. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, and I'll explain to you what it means fully come. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of explanation about Pentecost. There were three major feasts in Israel in the first month, the third month, and the seventh month of their calendar. And all of Israel was to gather at Jerusalem, and sometimes they gathered at other cities, but it was to be Jerusalem, and to celebrate these feasts, and they all represented something, okay? Passover represented when the spirit of death passed over the children of Israel when they were in Egypt. Passover was the first major feast, Pentecost, and then tabernacles, all right? Now, within those, you probably heard the seven feasts of Israel. Within Passover, there are three feasts, Within tabernacles, there are three feasts, and then you have the Feast of Pentecost, so that's where you get the seven. Within Passover, you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread um, and also the Feast of first fruits. Then you have Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, and then you have Tabernacles, which includes the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacles are booths, as it's called sometimes. And I, I could explain that, but I don't have time to go into all that. All right, so what is this? this feast that they're celebrating. Pentecost, you need to know, was the celebrating of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. It happened 50 days after Passover. 
But let me tell you what the word Pentecost means, okay? You can probably figure it out a little bit. Penta means five. It's from the Greek word means five, okay? Like a pentagon, the pentagon is five-sided. A gon is a side. Five-sided, it's a five-sided building, okay? Penta. Cost means to the tenth power. So Pentecost means 50th. And then it says when the day of Pentecost had fully come, this is what it means is when the 50th day arrived. That's, that's what it means. Okay, so the word Pentecost means 50th. But I want you to think about this. How many of us have a negative connotation of the word Pentecost? And you know what, what it means? 50. Okay, li- listen to me. 50. Isn't it scary? That's a scary word, isn't it? 50. Well, actually it is if you're talking about a birthday. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> it might be scary then. Why would you ever be scared of the word Pentecost and a word that's in the Bible? Now, it was 50 days after Passover. But, G- but God knew that his son was going to resurrect on the day after the Sabbath, and that Jesus would be on the earth 40 days, 40 is an important number in the Bible, and that they would be praying 10 days, that's 50. So I want to show you something that because if, you, if you're like me and you, numbers add up in your mind, you think, well, the Holy Spirit didn't come 50 days after Passover, because Jesus died on Passover. The Holy Spirit came 50 days after the resurrection, and he raised on the first day of the week, Sunday, it was the day after Sabbath. I want to show you something that God did in the law, all right? Because Passover could have fallen on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, Thursday, whenever. So Leviticus 23, verses 15 and 16 says, And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths, seven Sabbaths, that'd be seven weeks, Sabbath is one day a week, shall be completed. Now watch verse 16. Count 50 days to the day, after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Okay, here's, here's just, I love the Bible. I just love the Bible. Think about this. They were celebrating Pentecost. The giving of the law came 50 days after Passover. But God knew that his son would die on Passover, but would resurrect on the day after the Sabbath. So in Leviticus he says, I want you to start celebrating this feast. Don't start counting until the day after the Sabbath. Doesn't matter whether Passover's on Tuesday or Friday or what. When, on the day after the Sabbath, that's when you count the 50 days. Because God knew Jesus would be here 40 days. The disciples would pray 10 days. And so he wanted the Holy Spirit to come on the exact 50th day. Now, I just think that's cool. <laughs> that God likes math too, like I like math. All right, so it all works out. So what is Pentecost? All right, you ready again? Don't be scared when I say it, 50. That's all, that's all the word means is 50, 50th, okay? So here's the second question. What happened at Pentecost? What happened at Pentecost? All right, we stopped there, uh, and we'll come back and read verses 3 and 4 in a minute in Acts 2, but look at verses 5 and 6. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, from every nation nation, every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, this mighty rushing wind, the, holy, the, the multitude came together and were confused. I want you to remember the word confused because we're going to come back to that. Because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Okay, so there are people from every nation. They're confused and they hear this their own, na- their own language. They understand this. Think about this. Back in Genesis 11 is the story of the Tower of Babel. You remember that? They all spoke one language, but they were gathered in rebellion. On the day of Pentecost, they were gathered in submission. At the Tower of Babel, they were gathered in pride. Pentecost, they were gathered in humility. On the day, on the Tower of Babel, they all had one language. God came down and confused. That's what it says, confused their language, and they scattered to every nation. On the day of Pentecost, they all came back together, and God restored 
a pure language to them. And they heard the wonderful works of God. Pentecost is the blessed reversal of the cursed judgment of Babel. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue, if you want to know, by the way, this is what heaven's going to be like, every nation, the Greek word nation is ethnos, every ethnic group praising God. That's what heaven's going to look like. And it started at Pentecost. Okay, so this is the fulfillment of the Feast of Passover. It's when, the, the full, I mean, of Pentecost. Um, uh, they came, now, it was the giving of the law. Think again about the synergism of these two things. When the law was given, there was a loud noise. The cloud descended. There was fire. Uh, God wrote his law on tablets of stone. And on that day, when the law was given, 3,000 people died. On the day of Pentecost, there was a loud noise. The whole multitude heard it. There was fire. We're going to read about it in a minute. The fire. There was fire. Uh, God wrote it. The cloud descended. They were led by a fire by day cloud. But the whole, they were led by the Spirit. The, the Spirit descended. God wrote his law on men's hearts. And 3,000 people were saved. If you haven't figured it out yet, this is a good book. <laughs> this is a great book. And it's, it's just amazing how it all comes together like this. So the day of Pentecost is the fulfillment of that. Listen, when, when God gave the law, they couldn't keep it. Maybe, maybe you haven't read the book, but maybe you've seen the movie. <laughs> Moses is up on the mountain getting the law. And one of the laws is thou shalt not commit adultery. And you know what they're doing at the bottom of the mountain? Commit adultery. Before, just pardon the expression, but before the ink is even dry, they've broken the law. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he writes God's, God's righteous standard on your heart. Let me put it, to put it another way. Jesus came to make us in right standing with God. Because we could never be in right standing with God. Holy Spirit comes so that we can live righteously. He comes to empower us. If you think you can live in this fallen, sin-filled, demonic world without the power of the Holy Spirit, you're in for a rude awakening. Amen. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's the third question. Can I experience Pentecost? Can I... Can you, can I, can we today experience Pentecost? Because see, we li we're living today. The Holy Spirit came 2,000 years ago. So can we experience it? All right. Well, back in Acts chapter 2, look at verse 3. It says, then there, then there appeared to them divided tongues. Now, leave that up for just a moment just so you can see this. The word, see the word divide there. Look at divid, divid. All right, look at those two syllables, divid, okay? D-I-V-I-D. Think about another word, in-divid you all. In-divid you all. Okay, so when we think of divide, we think of something bad. This just means divided tongues means individual tongues. Everybody got one. That's what it means, okay? So, there appeared to them individual tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. Notice each of them, everybody, okay? And they were all, all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, let me go back again because tongues is a scary word to many people. Tongues comes from the Greek word glossa. Glossa. Can you think of any word we might get from that? Glossary. It just means language. And they begin to speak with other languages. As the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. All right, listen again. It's not, you don't have to be afraid when someone says tongues. You don't have to be afraid of that because it means language. And all these people heard the wonderful works of God in their own language. You, you see what I'm saying? Don't, be afraid, don't ever be afraid of reading the Bible. Whatever 
uh, religious upbringing you have, if it ever, if it made you afraid of the Bible, something's wrong with it. You should never be afraid to read the Bible. So these tongues came and there was a tongue of fire on everyone's head. Okay, so it's on top of your head. Let, let me say it this way. If it happened today, you could see a tongue of fire on top of my head. And I'd be able to see a tongue of fire on top of your head. Now, my personal opinion is, is that you couldn't see your own tongue of fire. Because it'd be up here and every time you'd look, you know, it'd be like that. <laughs> Now, here's the reason I'm telling you this. It's because you'd have to believe by faith that there was a tongue of fire on your head too. Do you know how you receive Jesus? <laughs> you have to receive by faith. Is that right? You know how you receive the Holy Spirit? By faith. You, you gotta remember there were 120 people in the upper room. So this baptism in the Holy Spirit wasn't just for the 12. Wasn't just for the people on the platform. It's for everyone. Everyone got a tongue of fire. But you have to believe it. You, you, you say, yeah, well, I, I know Pastor Robert's got one, and I can see so-and-so's got one, and so-and-so's got one. I don't know whether I have one or not. No, everyone got it. Are, are y'all following me? It's very important, all right? So the question is, can I? Can I experience this? Okay, look at Acts chapter 1. Just maybe back one page. Look at verse four. This is right before Jesus ascends. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Do you, do you see the word promise? Okay, so everyone see the word promise. It's very important. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said you've heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, so Jesus says, wait for the promise. And then he tells them what the promise is. It's the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Does everyone see that? It's simple. I mean, it's clear. You can't make that to be anything else. Wait, wait, don't go anywhere until the promise comes. Well, what is the promise? Well, you, John baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Spirit. So the promise is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, look at Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes. Peter stands up and preaches. And then some of them say, what, what do we have to do? What should we do? Here's Peter's answer. Acts 2, verses 38 and 39. Then Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized. This is water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. You gotta understand that it's not one gift, it's the Holy Spirit, he's the gift. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now watch verse 39 carefully. For the promise, did Jesus call this the promise? And what is the promise? The baptism in the Holy Spirit, right? For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Amen. See, we're trying to answer the question, well, can I receive it today? Say, I wasn't alive in that when Acts 2 happened. I wasn't alive back then. Can I receive it today? Okay, Jesus said the promise is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and this promise is for you and for your children and to all who are far off. Now, if you didn't realize this, when it says all who are afar off, that is a direct reference to Robert Morris. <laughs> because I was afar off. And you were too. Even if you were a church member. <laughs> you were afar off. As many as the Lord our God will call. Did God call you? Yeah. So the promise is still for you. Okay, so remember three feasts. Passover. Pentecost, Tabernacles. Okay, the fulfillment of Passover. Passover was fulfilled on the day Jesus died. On the day Jesus died, remember it was Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits in that first feast. Passover is when a lamb, a spotless lamb, was shed for the sins of the people. 
That's Jesus. By the way, on the very day that they were cutting the lamb's throat, they were to cut the lamb's throat at 9 o'clock. That's when they nailed Jesus to the cross. At 3 o'clock, they were to take the lamb then and prepare to put it in the oven. And at 3 o'clock, they took his body off the cross and put it in the tomb. He completely full Passover, fulfilled Passover. Then they would take a, a loaf, the unleavened bread, loaf of unleavened bread, and the father would hide it somewhere in the house. And you know when he would pull it out? He'd pull it out the morning after the Sabbath. And he would wave it before the Lord as a symbol of the first fruits harvest, is a first fruit, is a symbol of the harvest to come when the Father is pulling the loaf out of being hidden somewhere. Jesus is coming out of a, the tomb as the symbol of the first fruits of the harvest to come. It all, it all lines up. So, Passover has been fulfilled. Okay. Let's, let's, we'll come back to Pentecost. Tabernacles, what's tabernacles? Tabernacles includes three feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, you need to understand, one day the Tabernacles has not been fulfilled yet, but it will be fulfilled one day because a trumpet's gonna sound. And when that trumpet sounds, there's gonna be a judgment, but because of the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're gonna get to tabernacle with God for all eternity. <laughs> See, that's gonna be fulfilled. Okay, so I have a question for you. Can you experience the fulfillment of the Feast of Passover? In other words, can you receive Jesus as your spotless lamb that died for your sins? Can you? Yes. But wait a minute, you weren't alive back then. See, this is the argument against the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. That's all there is to it. It is ridiculous because we weren't alive back then. We sure missed out on something really wonderful, didn't we? Okay, you can experience the fulfillment of Passover right now, Amen. right? Well, what about when the trumpet sounds? What if you're not alive when the trumpet sounds? Can you experience the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles? Yes. If you believe in Jesus and that trumpet sounds, even if you're dead, the dead in Christ are gonna rise, right? So. Why? Explain it. Please explain it to me. Why we can experience the fulfillment of the Feast of Passover, and we can experience the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, but we can't experience the feast, the fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost. Simply because, well, we weren't alive then. I'm telling you, you can experience it. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit just like the disciples were and the 120 were in the upper room, even though you weren't alive back then. Uh, I have a friend, uh, Dr. Peter Lord. Some of you might have heard of him. He pastored for 30 years Park Avenue Baptist Church in Titusville, Florida. And great man of God. And he's preaching a series on the Holy Spirit and he had been trained by his theological upbringing that that was back then and we can't receive it today. So he's studying and all of a sudden the Lord said, just spoke to him in his quiet time and said, have you received the Holy Spirit? And he said, well, of course, Lord. He said, the Holy Spirit lives in me. When I got saved, the Holy Spirit came to live in me. And that is correct. The Holy Spirit lives in me. Of course I've received him. And at that time, it had been just a few months, uh, his mother-in-law, his wife's mother had come, she needed to come live with them. She'd come to live with him. And the Lord said, your mother-in-law lives in your house, but have you received her? Not fully. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord said to him, uh-huh. And the Holy Spirit lives in your house. But because of your upbringing, you have not fully received it. And I'm asking you, have you fully received 